So today we're, we're starting this new series, and uh, what I want to do with this series is kind of pick up where we left off at Easter. And so just a little recap, um, Jesus was standing with his disciples outside the city of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples a huge question. He said, who do people say that I am? And so they say, well, you know, this is kind of weird, but a lot of people are saying that you're sort of like a, a reincarnated person. Uh, maybe the Old Testament prophet Elijah, maybe John the Baptist. You know, again, you know, he hadn't been gone very long, but they're like, he's back. And uh, there's all these different theories going around about who you are. And so Jesus says, all right, how about you guys? Who do you say that I am? And Peter steps out and, and Peter says, okay, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the Holy One that was promised. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, bingo. That's right. And you didn't come up with that on your own. I mean, I know you. You didn't come up with that on your own. That idea was given to you from above. And then Jesus said, from now on, okay, I'm not calling you Simon anymore. I'm going to call you Peter, okay, which means rock. Because on this rock, Jesus said, I'm going to build a congregation. I'm going to build an assembly. And my death, and then he would look right at his disciples and he would say, and your death is not going to stop it. And Jesus promised that he would build an assembly, that he would build a congregation, a people, a movement of people that would be organized around a single idea, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And today, like every Sunday, Millions and millions and millions of people are gathered, like assembled, to honor Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Like, is that cool? It's cool. And so you think about this, and we don't think about this a lot when we come to church, but what's happening here is that that we together here are the fulfillment of a 2,000-year-old prophecy. And it's remarkable. And I'm not going to go into the, the, like, everything that we talked about at, at Easter But it is absolutely remarkable that that movement survived. Like Jesus died an outlaw, and his followers were outlaws. And they were up against powerful opposition, but somehow it all survived. Jesus was right. And the goal for Jesus was never just that people would gather, that people would come together. The goal was that those people would then become salt and light, that in his power, his people would actually go out and change the world. Like in a world that was ruled by the kingdom of Rome, ruled by men like Caesar and Herod, Jesus proclaimed the unstoppable power of a new kingdom, and he insisted that this kingdom had become present on earth, and that anybody could become a part of it. And he promised that it would last forever, that nothing could stop it. And he had claimed that this this kingdom arrived on earth through him. That it was present on earth somehow because he was present on earth. But that it would one day be bestowed to his followers, to his gathering, to his assembly. Those that would look to him and trust him. That he would continue his work on earth then through them. And guys, that is exactly what's happened. You think about how remarkable that is. That is exactly what's happened. The influence of Jesus has exceeded the influence of any other person that has ever lived, ever. No person's teaching, no person's life has imprinted the world like Jesus. Like you think about our culture, our values, our government systems, our priorities as a people, as a nation, have been so deeply touched by Jesus that it is, it's like, it's staggering And it's not just the values of of church people. I'm not just talking about, okay, the religious right. But entire societies in which people live. I'm talking about Republicans and Democrats. Talking about religious people and non-religious people. Okay, I'm talking about Europe and I'm talking about North America and Australia and Africa and Asia and South America. No one has left a deeper imprint on our world than Jesus But I believe that Jesus, and this is kind of weird, he doesn't really get the credit that he deserves. 
while back, I had my mind blown uh, by a book by a guy named John Ortberg. And um, it is a brilliant piece of work that tracks certain trends in human history and where they, where they originated from. Traces them back all the way to their roots. And many of them he traces right back to Jesus. And the book is called, Who is This Man? Um, how, have, how many of you have read this? Man, it's so good. And I wish that I could make all of you read it and discuss it and ponder it. But because I know that that is not going to happen, in this series, I'm going to give you some of the stuff that really hit me. Okay? So, so I give John Ortberg credit for this entire series. If something sounds good, it's because it came from John Ortberg. Actually, I give Jesus all the credit. Um, John Ortberg just sort of wrote about it. But today I want to start with, I want to start with something that I think we just take for granted. I want to start with the idea that we deeply value human dignity. One of the most sacred creeds, maybe the most sacred creed of our nation, is this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everybody matters. Everyone has value. Like, we really believe this, don't we? We really believe this. And this is why when something happens like Donald Sterling, okay, the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers, who made his, like, outrageous, you know, uh, racist comments, the nation just flew into a frenzy over what happened, what he said. And they, they were calling for a very swift and very immediate punishment. And that's why most people really, really celebrated NBA commissioner Adam Silver, who fined Sterling the maximum amount that he could, $2.5 million, and then banned him for life from the NBA. You know why? Because we don't tolerate that sort of racist stuff, because we truly believe, don't we, that everybody matters, that everyone is endowed with certain unalienable rights. In January, our, our family uh, took in a 16-year-old boy named David, and most of you know this. And to make a really long story short, um, he's no longer with us, for those of you that didn't know that. We, when he moved in, set some very clear and very firm boundaries with him, and he chose to willfully violate those. And so he moved out. And we were in the process of working toward him moving back in when he decided to do something very different and go a different direction and so two weeks ago, he moved to Idaho. And I'm not going to go into the heartbreak of all of that for us and how difficult all that's been, because uh, that's not why I bring it up. In, in having David live with us, we saw the U.S. government system at work. And uh, now, you know, as many of you know, it is flawed in many, many ways. Uh, it's not always efficient. Funds don't always go to the right places at the right time. But you would not believe the resources that get leveraged at kids. You wouldn't believe it. You would not believe the resources that get poured into kids that have no families, that have no adults to care for them. Now, that is not a complaint. It's not a criticism at all. In fact, it's, it's absolutely the opposite. I think it's awesome. Now, resources are not always well used. But it is undeniable. In our society, we value kids. Okay, we value even orphans. We value them enough to invest tons and tons and tons of tax dollars. Why? Because we really believe everyone matters. Everyone is endowed with certain unalienable rights, and that is a beautiful thing. Now, I know that there are still racists and child abusers and, and horrible people, and I know that not everyone believes or believes perfectly that everybody matters. Not everybody treats people with dignity and respect all of the time. I know that there's still racism. I know there's still hatred. I know there's still all kinds of junk that goes on. Okay, we have not completed the journey. But as a whole, our society truly holds human dignity sacred. We do. Now, if we don't give this some serious thought, we can assume, well, 
People have always thought this way. But we would be so wrong. We would be so, so wrong. Like all peoples in the ancient world had gods. And their gods had different names. You know, Zeus and Apollos and, and all of that. But what they shared, depart, you know, independent of what, where they lived, and what they shared was a, this belief in sort of a hierarchical way of ordering life. Okay, at the top of creation, for really all the people in the ancient world, were the gods. And then under them, immediately under them, was the king. And then under the king were the members of the king's court and the priests and, and those who reported to the king. And then below them were the artisans and the merchants and the craftspeople. And below them, then, at the very bottom, was this massive group of peasants and slaves. Okay, like the dregs of humanity, and most people fell into that category. Now, the king was thought to be divine, or at least semi-divine. The king was understood to be made in the image of his God, whoever that God was. And the only, only the king, though, was thought to be made in the image of God. And this is, of course, what separated the king from the rest of humanity. Okay, this was the massive dignity gap. And, of course, the farther down the ladder, the wider the gap. Okay, so imagine now what it did to the hearts of peasants and slaves and sick people. Imagine how it went over with the dregs of humanity when this peasant rabbi insisted again and again, no, no, everyone has been created in the image of God. Male and female, rich and poor, royalty and slaves. Everyone has worth. Everybody matters. There may be different levels of talent. There may be different levels of strength, of intelligence, of beauty. And when it comes to that stuff, there are what we might call gradations. Okay? Gradations, different levels. But as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, there are no gradations of the image of God. And we truly believe this. We truly believe this, but not everybody always has. The idea of equality of all human beings was absolutely not self-evident in the ancient world. Aristotle. Aristotle didn't believe that all men had been created equal. He wrote that inequality, like masters and slaves, was the natural order of things. Now listen to this. This is what he wrote. He said, For that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjugation, others for rule. Now, who came in between Aristotle and Thomas Jefferson? How did our society come to value all people? In the ancient world, the devaluing of people led to all kinds of brutal customs. I mean, it's just unreal, unfathomable. For instance... Unwanted children were simply left to die. Can you imagine that? They are just left to die. It was a practice called, does anybody know what it's called? Exposure. That's right. And it was legally protected by Roman law. Legally protected. Think about that. If you were the head of your household, you could do that to anybody you wanted to. It was, it was protected by law. And so abandoned children were usually left maybe in a dump, or they were left maybe on a dung hill. And ancient Roman law said that a boy who was strikingly deformed, whatever that means, had to be disposed of quickly. One archaeological dig found the bones of 100 babies that apparently had been murdered and thrown into the sewer. Think about that. Into that world, Jesus came and he said things about children that nobody said. One day, Jesus was asked a deep theological question. He was asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And here's his response. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus said, it says, he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of the child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Children, guys, children had no value in the ancient world. They were weak, they were helpless, they were useless. And they were pushed aside, and they were expected to be silent. One time Jesus is teaching, and we're told that people were trying to bring children to him. So the disciples went out and they stopped him, and they were like, you know what, no kids, this is a kid-free zone. And they rebuked the parents. And Jesus turned around, and he rebuked his disciples. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. A kingdom for children. This is before Walt Disney. (laughs) And the children came. After his death and resurrection, as the movement of Jesus spread, it created an alternative community that began to honor children. When followers of Jesus began to assemble, they very quickly rejected the practice of exposure, the common practice of exposure. In fact, because the average life expectancy in their world was 30 years old or so, there were orphans everywhere, everywhere. And for the first time in history, this new community actually began to collect money to be able to care for them in an organized way. And eventually, at at baptism, became practice, this kind of standard practice, that children would receive what were called godparents. And these were people who promised to care for the children if their parents died. In the fourth century, a, a Christian Roman emperor, which is just shocking to the world, a Christian Roman emperor outlawed exposure. It became illegal and banned throughout the entire Roman Empire. And over time, instead of leaving unwanted babies on a dunghill or in a garbage dump, people started leaving them outside of little Christian monastic communities, started leaving them outside Christian cathedrals and churches. The beginnings of what would be known as orphanages began to to rise, usually associated with monasteries or cathedrals or churches. Now, I've been thinking about this because we just take this for granted. The world that we live in, we assume, has always been. It has not always been. I've been thinking about how deeply valued kids are in our culture, and it's pretty crazy when you think about it. Um, This winter, our our whole family coached some basketball. So Jen and and, and I and Kate and Cam, we took a little team at the YMCA, and we decided we we were going to sign Brooklyn up, and then our whole family would coach. And so, like, Jen put this out on Facebook and said, hey... We're going to coach a team. It's kindergarten, first grade, boys and girls. Anybody that, that wants to come play with us, come on, come play with us. And so we ended up with, and if you can see this well enough to recognize, there were six Brookview kids on our little team in Muckleteo. And uh, so through the course of a couple of games, we got some really sweet action shots. And I just thought I'd share some of these with you guys. Let's see what we got there. Oh, yeah, look at Brennan. He's ready. He's ready to take the ball to the hole. Look at that. All right, who else we got? Oh, yeah, Nicholas. He was an animal. We used to do this rebounding drill, and he was just an absolute animal. I mean, every ball was his. He was crazy. All right, who else we got? There's Caleb Coates putting up a sweet jumper. That kid could probably shoot it from half court. Have you seen the guns on that kid? (laughs) Unbelievable. At the walk the other day, he decided to drop down and give somebody 20, and he was ripping off push-ups like a marine or something it was unbelievable okay who else do we have there's Brooklyn a little Jordan impression and I'm sure pretty sure she scored on the play because what kind of defense is this kid playing (laughs) he's looking good for the camera though all right who's next Jaden Man, Jaden was, uh, Jaden was something else. When he first got there, I mean, he's so fast. This kid is one of the fastest little kids I've ever seen. But he was so unsure of what was happening that he would just freeze. And uh, by the end of the season, though, he was, he was an animal. We've got a, a, let's go to the next picture. Here he is taking the ball to the basket. And if you can tell, he's a little out of focus because he was a blur. 
uh, same game, there's a, a ball, the ball goes down the ground, and so he's, he's in there fighting for the ball like a mad dog. Now, who do you think is going to win this, him or the kid in red? Do we have the next slide? Yeah, Jaden. <laughs> he was unbelievable. The, the last game, um, he started just taking the ball to the basket like he got it. It clicked. He just started taking the ball to the basket. We've got another photo. And he just was just, I mean, going to the basket. And I'm not kidding you. He had, for a kid that age, he had five hoops in one game at the end of the season. It was unbelievable. And we've actually, um, we've got a slide I think it was Eugene that took it, and he, he got the most amazing shot of Jaden from the other angle. And you can see the athleticism that developed in him through unbelievable coaching over the course <laughs> of the season. Um, do we have that slide of Jaden from the other angle? There he is. <laughs> it's just, I'm telling you, when you get good coaches, it's like crazy stuff happens. We had a ball with those kids. It was unbelievable. And uh, you, the other thing that was unbelievable was it wasn't just us. You would not believe how many people came to those games. We've got a slide here. And if you look at those people, it, was, by the, it must have been a timeout. They don't look riveted. But uh, if you look at and you can see well enough, most of the people in that slide don't have a kid out there. I mean, it's just Brookview people and grandparents and whoever is there. Now, Here's my question. Why would all of those people show up to watch five and six-year-olds play basketball? Why? I guarantee you it was not because the hoops was high quality. It's because we believe that kids matter. We value children. We show up to soccer games. We show up to dance recitals. We show, we show up at their schools to go on them with field trips. We show up wherever we can because we want them to know you matter to me. We want them to know you are precious and you matter to me. Guys, this is not the way people have always thought about kids. In the ancient world, okay, there, there, was, there were no YMCA basketball leagues for kids. There were no dance clubs or soccer clubs or Little League or Campfire for, for Girls. No one was raising money for kids' programs. Okay, there, there was no Boy Scouts. There was no Girl Scouts. There were no Thin Mints or Samoas or Caramel Delights. It's a horrible, horrible way to live. In Jesus' day, nobody gathered in mass at the YMCA to honor and celebrate kids playing basketball badly. You know why? Well, I'm sure there were many, many factors. But here's a big one. They didn't see kids the way that we do. John Ortberg writes this. He says, there were many clubs and associations in the ancient world. None of the qualities associated with children, weakness, Helplessness, lowliness, qualified one to join any of them. There were no clubs for children until Jesus. Guys, Jesus changed the way we think about people. Like the intrinsic value every person has. Guys, it has not always been self-evident. And it's not just children. It's anybody Strong or with a weakness of any kind. In the ancient world, people were cast aside like garbage. The followers of Jesus, though, they took his, his sayings as sacred. You know, things like, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take a hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Or look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your Father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now, the point here is not that God doesn't value sheep or sparrows. He values them more than we can possibly comprehend. He feeds the birds. He gives them trees, and he gives them twigs for nests, and he gives them other birds to mate with. God cares. 
But Jesus cares even more, and this is the point, about you. Now, when you care about somebody, you notice the details about them. When a baby's born, most parents, I don't know if this happened to you, if, for those of you that are parents, like in the delivery room, most parents count the fingers and toes. And if one is missing, they notice. Like, even mediocre parents do this. <laughs> Jesus was saying, okay, look, God cares about you so much that he even numbers the hairs on your head. Like, he notices their quantity. He mourns with you when they go away. He even notices their color. Psalm 1631 might be very encouraging for some of you. Gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained in the way of righteousness. How about that? When you see a person with gray hair, you're supposed to stop in wonder and admiration because you are looking at a spiritual giant. It says so right in the Bible. Actually, I'm, I'm, just so you know, just for anybody, <clears throat> that is not sound interpretation. Okay, and I've digressed a little bit. Here's the point. The point is, what is the point? The point is, people matter to God. Okay, all people. And the community of Jesus' earliest followers believed it, and they lived it. Like during the reign of, of Emperor Marcus Aurelius, how many of you have heard of Marcus Aurelius? During the reign of Marcus Aurelius, around 165 AD, an epidemic of what was probably smallpox killed a third to a fourth of the entire population, okay, including Marcus Aurelius himself. Less than a century later came a second epidemic. And it's at its worst, at, at, the, at the, you know, the heyday of this thing, 5,000, imagine this, 5,000 people were dying a day just in the city of Rome. And for the most part, people in the empire responded in panic. Because there was no guidance in the writings of Homer. No commands from the Greek god Zeus to risk your life attempting to care for people that were dying. One Greek historian wrote about a, a similar plug that, that happened in Athens. And he says, they died with no one to look after them. The bodies of the sick were heaped up one on top of the other. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest. Sorry, Mom. Throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread and contagion of the fatal disease. That's how people were treated in Athens. But in Rome, there was a small but quickly growing community. A gathering of people that followed a man and they remembered that he used to touch lepers. That he told his disciples to go out and show compassion and heal the sick and be with them. And here's an ancient description of their response to the plague in Rome. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. So apparently, they took the words of Jesus very seriously when he said, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. People that lived by these words led to a revolution in humanity. In the early centuries of the church, leprosy was the worst of diseases. It meant isolation, it meant suffering, and it meant eventual, gradual death. But a church father named Basil had an idea. And he said, what if we, what if we build a place 
like a, a place designated to love and care for lepers. They don't have money? No problem. They don't even have to pay for it. You know what? We'll go out and we'll raise all the money for it for them. One of the most famous sermons in that century was by his brother, a guy named Gregory of Nyssa, to raise money for the cause of leprosy. And this is what Gregory preached. Listen to this. He says, lepers have been made in the image of God in the same way you and I have and perhaps preserve that image better than we. Let us take care of Christ while there is still time. Let us minister to Christ's needs. Let us give Christ nourishment. Let us clothe Christ. Let us gather Christ in. Let us show honor to Christ. And that movement was the beginning of what we now know as hospitals. Soon it was decreed that every cathedral also needed a hospice, a place where the poor and the sick could be cared for. Now you think about that. Where does the idea of gathering the sick come from? Where does the idea of raising money to care for the sick come from? It came right out of the movement of Jesus. And this is why even today, many hospitals have names like Good Samaritan or Good Shepherd or St. Anthony. Okay, my kids, Kate and Cam, were born in, in Bellingham at a hospital called St. Joseph's. Can you imagine a world without hospitals? Guys, there once was such a world. But a man entered that world and he taught people to love. And out of that love sprang up hospitals and organizations of all kinds delivering compassion. Another follower of Jesus named Jean-Henri Dumont cringed at the sound of soldiers crying on the battlefield. So the Swiss philanthropist devoted his life to helping them. And, and his movement led to what's now known as an organization called the Red Cross. Every time you see the Red Cross, you see the thumbprint of Jesus. And this is true of tons and tons of organizations. The Salvation Army, World Vision, the YMCA. It's true of Samaritan's Purse. It's true of Compassion International. I could go on and on. All these have sprung directly out of the movement of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying by any means that Christians have cornered the market on compassion. Not at all. Some of the most compassionate people I know are not followers of Jesus, Jesus in the slightest. Okay? There's some very compassionate non-Christian people, people of other faiths. But here's my question. How did compassion become so popular? Why is it that even atheists believe that all people are created equal? You ever think about that? Why is our society, Christian and non-Christian, so unwaveringly devoted to caring for those that are in need? The greatest minds and teachers before Jesus did not think this way. Okay, how did the world transition from the thoughts of Aristotle, who wrote, okay, from the hour of their birth, some are marked for, for subjugation, others for rule, to thoughts like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Who came in between Aristotle and Thomas Jefferson? How did our society come to value what we value? Here's the incredible thing about the one that we follow. Jesus paid attention to the people that nobody paid attention to. He announced the availability of a kingdom different from the kingdom of Caesar, different from the kingdom of Herod. A kingdom where blessing, where the full value and worth of God would be conferred upon the poor and the meek and the persecuted. At the time... People did not understand fully what this meant. We still don't. 
And I just want to close today by saying that I am so ridiculously proud of this little assembly, this little congregation that comes together in the name of Jesus for what happened last weekend and this week to help people in another part of the world far away from us that need help. Can I just say that in the Roman world, nobody in one part of the empire that had wealthy people that had means in it was out raising money so that people in the other part of the empire could have clean water. But you guys came together in a torrential downpour and you forced your children abusively to endure that for the sake of other people. And it will make a difference. It will make a difference. I'm excited for us to finally have a total next week. What you guys did was amazing. And this is why it's important for for followers of Jesus to come together. It's important for us to go into our different locations, into our different venues, and love everybody. Love everybody. Into your school, into your workplace, into your neighborhood, into your extended family. Love everybody. And then also to come together and to get organized and do something that none of us can do on our own. Jesus has painted a new vision for how valuable people are and he's inviting you and me to embrace it and to live in it.